Hi, uh, my name is Aisha Saigon. We're in the Cognitive Science and Neuroscience Department. And I'm going to talk about social robotics and social neuroscience. Social robotics is a rapidly growing field, uh, as many of, you, many of you are aware. Um, and also, more broadly, I'm going to talk about artificial agents, um, such as animated characters uh, as well. But in the first part, I'll focus on robotics. Now, these robots, interactive robots, social robots, are being developed as applications in many different domains, uh, such as entertainment, but also healthcare, education. Some of the examples are uh, using these uh, robots as companions for older or disabled individuals, or as playmates for uh, children with autism. But one issue that we need to understand, we need to study human factors in uh, guiding our interactions with these agents uh, before these agents can actually go and uh, fulfill their, their goals, they need to be acceptable by their human users. So what kinds of robots should be made? What we propose to do is to um, look at social neuroscience, look for answers in the human brain. Uh, in the field of social neuroscience, I'm going to really gloss over a lot of the biological details. So if you're a neuroscientist or interested in the details, please ask me later. But one of the most, com most uh, studied aspects of social neuroscience is how we understand others, how we understand their movements, their uh, infer from their actions, their intentions, uh, and so on. And in the human brain, this is a lateral view of the brain, um, there are these three roughly marked regions, and you don't really need to worry about what they're called. One in the back that's more involved in analyzing complex movements, one in the front that is actually a motor area which is involved in planning your own movements, and this is the area that connects them. Uh, you may have heard of mirror neurons which are found in these two areas in the uh, non-human primates, uh, and what these neurons do is they're literally, uh, they're motor neurons in that they're firing when the monkey does an action, but they also fire when the monkey sees the same action. So essentially the monkeys, these cells are mirroring what other people are doing. Uh, it's a bit controversial how much of this system is analogous in the human brain, but the idea that I wanna give at this point is whether or not they're exactly mirror neurons, this idea of motor resonance, when we understand other people, so when I wave my hand like this, in you trying to figure out what I'm doing, you use your own brain's motor representations. So therefore, this system of brain areas and the computations in them might allow us to make a link between ourselves and others. For this reason, this topic has got uh, a lot of interest from uh, social scientists because obviously this kind of link might allow us to have um, capabilities such as empathy or might be involved in disorders of social functioning such as autism. We use uh, non-invasive recordings of human brain activity using MRI and functional MRI. Uh, this is again non-invasive and we can uh, measure the structure as well as the function of the human brain. Now in, our, uh, in the past few years, we have been focusing on the role of biological motion. And in these stimuli, what we try to do iso is isolate motion signals as much as possible so that you're characterizing body movements by motion signals uh, almost exclusively. So there are, uh, you may have seen these in uh, motion capture situations. There are a few markers attached to the body and about a dozen dots are sufficient to evoke uh, clearly what the person is doing, in this case a number of sporting, kicking type of actions, but you can also see whether it's a male or a female, and uh, whether they're angry or happy and so on. Now in the brain, the, the back area and the front area that we talked about are highly active when people view this kind of motions, uh, but not other kinds of motions. So the next question we asked, we, uh, after we identified the roles of motion was, do looks matter? So in all of these images, you can see someone making, uh, playing football, but playing soccer, but uh, they have different appearances. Now, if we think about this idea of motor resonance, this might be an important thing, because if I'm linking myself and another body, and if another body if, if there's a high degree of similarity between my body and that body, that simulation or resonance might be stronger. So how human-like does a scene action have to be? Now, humanoid robots and other artificial intelligence become very interesting in this context because they can allow us to address this question. Now, a robot can perform recognizable actions, but it doesn't have truly biological motion, and as in at least today's robots, uh, but also, uh, unlike human beings, uh, currently, their appearance can be much more and much less human-like. So 
not only do we want to sort of help social robotics using social neuroscience, but social robotics can help social neuroscience because these agents allow us an opportunity to test functional properties of these brain systems that we're interested in. Um, so, what? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I have 10 minutes left or. Okay. Um, so what we can do is use these agents as sort of test bed for uh, testing the functional properties of the brain areas that we're interested in. Say, are they specific to human-like movements? Are they selective for a human-like appearance? Now, a humanoid robot is basically a robot that has some human-like resemblance. But on the end uh, of the spectrum, we have androids, what, what I call in this talk, uh, refer to as androids, which are highly human-like uh, humanoid robots. So these robots have, in addition to you know, limbs and a torso and a head, really you know, the proportions of the limbs are similar to a human being. There's a face uh, and, and a skin and eyelashes and hair and so on, where there's you know, high human resemblance. Now one might think, obviously, we should make robots more human-like if we're going to use them in social settings and if this motor resonance theory is true you want to make them as similar to humans as possible. The issue with that is this um, uncanny valley phenomenon. According to this is if you consider this to be increasing human likeness uh, when you make an artificial agent human-like people's response to it becomes positive up to a certain point where actually increased human likeness leads to this negative response uh, which, in which the robot or the agent appears corpse-like or zombie-like or weird or disturbing or creepy. And then here we have the uh, human being. Now there's some, uh, and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence for this and you may have experienced it yourself because sometimes it happens in um, movies too. However, it's important to note that this is a hypothesis and this, these nice curves here are not actually coming from real data. There are some studies uh, relating to the uncanny valley, but um, we don't really have anything well specified as this curve here. So I'll tell you about one uh, brain imaging study that we have done and some new directions that we're taking uh, with the CalIT support. This is an android developed in Japan uh, in our collaborator Hiroshi Ishiguro's lab. Her, um, she's, she doesn't walk, but she can move the upper body, the face, and the head. And she's been modeled after this um, person, so her face is actually uh, molded and copied onto the robot. Uh, the person, the human, is a TV presenter, TV news presenter, so the um, android is also doing kind of presenting kind of movements. Um, it doesn't have as many degrees of freedom as you would think, but it's pretty good in uh, its appearance. But some people do find it uncanny. Now, we were able to do something quite important for our experimental designs anyway. We videotaped this android in its original appearance, but we also basically skinned it such that we had the same machine, which means that the kinematics of the body movements will be the same, but with two different appearances. Uh, so here in this case, you have something that looks pretty human-like at first sight, and this one, because you have all this mechanics that's revealed, is not a human being, even though they are the same robot, I'm going to call this the robot, and this the android, and this the human. And this is the same human that she's been modeled after. Uh, and we had two second video clips of very simple actions. We started simple with this experiment, just action observation. Now in terms of the brain, what we're looking at here is, are there, is does there seem to be selectivity for human-like appearance or human-like motion? Uh, in this case, the robot and the android, they share motion, but they differ in appearance. And the, um, the android and the human share appearance, but differ in motion. Now, in, this, in one sense, the robot and the android are maximally different from each other. But in one sense, they're similar to each other. And that is that the, uh, both of these agents have a match between how they look and how they move. And the android uh, is the case where you have a mismatch. And we're going to come back to that. So as I say, uh, we're using it, the MRI scanner, and we get data from the scanner, and we get nice brains with blobs on them, and I hope you trust me that we know what we're doing in that middle step, which I'm going to completely skip. Now, wh what I'm showing here is not uh, just activation when you view this, uh, but areas that are computation that we think are underlie the computation of action perception for this stimulus. 
if you look, what I want to draw your attention to is even though the, an the human and the robot are maximally different from each other, the brain's response to the two agents look fairly similar. That back area that we talked about, uh, high-level visual motion processing area is activated. This is different when we see uh, the response patterns for the android. Now, without even knowing too much about the anatomy or, you know, the brain, you can see very pretty clearly that these two a lot look a lot more like each other than this one. And so all these additional regions are getting interested and uh, activated by the android. Uh, it's most significant in the uh, parietal lobe, which is the node connecting that network, is the central part of the network, and it's bilateral, which is reassuring. Now, what do we conclude from this in terms of, uh, in terms of the brain? First of all, it doesn't look like the brain has a, uh, I mean, we were never looking for finding something like, we cannot conclude that these areas are actually, you know, Android processing areas. It doesn't make any evolutionary sense. However, it might have made sense to find some human specific mechanisms. We did not find that. Instead, what we found was that the, the two agents that look similar to each other, looks human, moves human, looks like a robot, moves like a robot. These patterns of activity look similar to each other, whereas if you had this android which looked like a human but moved like a robot, your brain has to handle with that unexpected uh, occurrence because it doesn't normally occur. And this might change in the future when we become accustomed to these technologies, but at present, our, our, we, we're not accustomed to something that looks like a human but moves in that particular manner. So what we think is going on is that this network is trying to figure out what's uh, happening and it needs to send some signals back and forth to uh, correct the error that one area might be making that this is a really human being. Uh, so we have a number of follow-up studies which we hope might link this uh, prediction error to the uncanny valley. One uh, future step that we need to have is uh, because we're using magnetic resonance imaging, that magnetic, that magnet is pretty serious constraint. We cannot have any metal in the vicinity. Subjects are lying in this tiny little uh, head coil. So it's not a very socially interactive environment. It's somewhat uh, astonishing that we can still, st like the, the human brain is so social that even in that kind of very passive state, you're lying, viewing things, these social areas are activated even then. However, we hope to take this into a little bit more realistic situations using virtual reality and EEG. Now, of course, uh, we started with these three agents, but there's so many, uh, so much more space to traverse in terms of possible appearance motion combinations. And we haven't, uh, we've only used these three exemplars so far. We could obviously have had a humans dressed up in robots condition, which we thought, let's leave it out of the first experiment, uh, but we're getting to that. So we want to traverse the space, uh, and we hope to do this with animation because we can, we can actually, uh, we don't have to build a robot each time, which can get a little impossible for your neuroscience lab at least. So if you're uh, working in this kind of field, uh, we'd be happy to uh, collaborate with those who have more experience than we do about this. Now about this also, we have this predictive coding hypothesis. So it remains to be seen whether anything that we have observed so far is specific to robotics or the uncanny valley, or simply uh, that the brain's perceptual expectations are not met. So we hope to um, study a broader set of perceptual expectation violations and hope also to look at whether these expectation violations, whether they're non-social, such as a blue apple, are different from when, when such violations occur with uh, biological or um, age, um, interactive social stimuli. One last thing uh, that we're doing is, of course, we talk about a network that's talking to different parts of it, renegotiating uh, uh, percepts. Therefore, the time course of processing is really important, and fMRI is not very good at looking at that. So we're collecting MEG and EEG data to look at that. One thing that we have done uh, with EEG, and we have a poster on the sixth floor uh, with more details of this, is what's called multivariate pattern analysis, which is basically machine learning. So instead of analyzing the data in that magic box, what we do is we take brain imaging data, and we try to predict from that whether a person is looking at you know, a chair or a shoe, uh, or a robot or not, or a human. So once we can learn these patterns, we can apply uh, these techniques to future applications uh, such as brain-computer interfaces. Um, these are my collaborators I want to thank, and I want to thank the uh, 
funding, and especially CalIT, uh, who didn't think it was so odd for a neuroscientist to be uh, playing with robots, which is what most neuroscientists, neuroscience kind of funding uh, people would think, without preliminary data. And thank you. Yes. Metallurgy is all about that. Like when you have Michelangelo, for example, making those, those uh, 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 appearances, are there any things we can learn from that uh, history as to yes. why we create characters one way or the other? Absolutely. And in fact, like that's how I, I wrote my application to pointing out those things. Even if you look at creation myths, like there's all this idea that God created us in his image and we are now doing this uh, ourselves. The one thing is, uh, yeah, I think we definitely can learn uh, from dolls. Uh, but I think there might be differences, and that's what we want to explore. There might be differences in people versus artifacts, uh, but there definitely is something like that that has engaged humans for a really long time. Do I have time for more? Mm -hmm. In my brain, obviously, I'm trying to figure it out. But obviously, you know, people like it. So when I can wonder how is this new development in popular culture uh, seems to go against that kind of hypothesis, right? But yet, your research seems to point, suggest that, in fact, in the series, right, there's some kind of, when we get into the kind of this, uh -huh. some kind of part, your brain is trying to figure out what's going on, and maybe that's why those areas are activated. Yeah, that's what we think anyway. But there are so many things that. For instance, are, what, what, why do we have individual differences? Can we get used to these things? So for instance, do the Japanese who make these robots have less of an uncanny valley than we do? There are a lot of debates about this. Not The answers are not known. But yeah, for instance, in Avatar, if they were not blue, perhaps they would be more uncanny. So that's what our theory would predict anyway. Thank you.